good evening everyone uh, today we are going to discuss uh, about uh, genetics in critical ill newborn not necessarily just restricting ourselves to the next generation sequencing i think as of all of you would be a practicing pediatrician or neonatologist or pediatric neurologist so we'll have a broad range of uh, discussion and we can have interaction at the end of it i would have been happy if you had had a live interaction uh, at least to interrupt in between the cases and discuss uh, but because this is a webinar probably that is not going to be possible so we'll just have few questions at the beginning and then we'll try to see how we can get those answers in various clinical situations of the nicu so as you all know we are rapidly uh, making strides in the next generation sequencing testing and uh, the amount of information what we are able to get in last 6 years which was not possible for many many years before that this is all because of advances in the genetics so now it's been used in lots of intensive care situations in hospital situations as compared to what we generally do in the out of hospital or uh, the outpatient based situation so why and when do you want to do the next generation sequencing testing or any other genetic testing in the nicu so this is a broad question what we are trying to discuss today and what is the utility of it so in nicu if you are suspecting a genetic disorder and the child is on a ventilator and is difficult to wean obviously as we all know each day of uh, stay in nicu will cost significant amount of money to the family and it's very difficult so you need to have whether this is a condition where i can treat i can get the child out of uh, ventilator at any point of time can the child have a good quality of life similarly a suspected genetic disorder with multi organ dysfunction high end support for long duration your questions are the same once again and a child with refractory epilepsy without structural and easily identified etiology once again you are uh, trying to see whether the bottom line is whether it's a treatable pathology or not treatable whether it's a life limiting disorder and or it can, the child can have independent existence with what are the treatment we can offer at this point of time i think these are the things which are going to be most important questions as a clinical uh, clinician you want to answer to the family so that is where uh, the ngs or other genetic testings will come into the scenario so what are the challenges so there is lot of phenotypic variability there can be incomplete penetrance variable expressivity genetic heterogeneity so even for a highly homogeneous and clinically recognizable phenotypes there are a lot of genetic heterogeneity so which will actually complicate the diagnostic work up and in the neonatal uh, age group there are a lot of comorbidities which are there when they are in the nicu so there is a can be a poor index of suspicion for a genetic condition the, because the disease phenotype may not be fully expressed sometimes the contractures might not have developed the sometimes the wasting of the muscles might not have set in very well so that can give rise to a uh, phenotype which is not fully expressed and the clinical signs might be subtle and uh, highly uh, non specific or masked in the critical conditions so that makes it all the more challenging for a neonatologist or a pediatrician who is treating this critical ill neonates to suspect and recognize the phenotype so whenever we are ordering a test there is something called the ace so these are the things which will help us to know what is the uh, utility of a given test in a given setting so whether there is an analytical validity of it whether there is a clinical validity for the test whether there is a clinical utility and associated ethical legal and social implications of the framework so we'll just quickly go through for our understanding because these are important terminologies which we'll learn analytical validity is accuracy with which a test determines the genotype of interest so you send a blood test the it's a technical assessment so it's a bioinformatics people who look at this blood sample and they call out saying that yes i am found a abnormality so whether or the not the genotype is likely to be pathogenic they are not interested they'll just call out and say there is a genotype in this blood sample so that is analytical validity whereas clinical validity is a measure of test ability to diagnose a specific phenotype such as a genetic disease accurately like you have sent a sample and then you have got a 
genetic variation. So whether both of them are matching. So you're able to pick up the abnormality with the accuracy. So that is the clinical validity of the test. Whereas clinical utility is, once you get the result, what are you going to do with it? So it depends on the availability of effective management, if in particularly in the, uh, life limiting conditions, okay, you say, I'm not able to do anything, I'll discontinue the care of the child. Whereas some conditions like, for example, very simple example is a spinal muscular atrophy, wherein you get a genetic testing and then you say it is SMA. At this point of time, most of the people are not able to yeah, access that uh, treatment because of the economic implications and the accessibility of the treatment. So all these things will affect the clinical utility of the results what we get. And it's also we should remember that every person's uh, genome differs by around 4 to 5 million nucleotides from the standard reference genome. So there are only one or two variants that are actually causal for Mendelian disease in affected individual, which has to be distinguished from noise of millions of variants that are unrelated to disease. So it can be just there without causing any problem. So, but you should try to look out for those one or two variants that are actually causing that single uh, gene disorder. And the variants that can be detected by diagnostic uh, NGS are associated with more than 5,000 different phenotypes. Humanly impossible for a clinician to remember all of them. That's why we always have to go back to your uh, OMIM. You uh, narrow down your list of clinical handles. Most important clinical has to be noted down and then go back to OMIM and type it down and see what are the different clinical variations you get and then ask for the specific testing. So demonstrating clinical validity for the genetic variants associated with each of disease would be very challenging. And most of the conditions are rare, as we all know, and our knowledge of their penetrance, phenotypic spectra, and natural history is still incomplete. Although we are much, much better than what we were there 10 years back, but it is still incomplete. That is what we need to understand. So I think it's the same thing, determining the clinical utility of uh, NGS from thousands of different gene disorders on gene by gene basis, disease by disease basis is very difficult. And the clinical utility is where availability and efficacy of medical interventions uh, from whether it's a non-specific treatment or a specific treatment of proven benefit uh, is what is the evidence of clinical utility. We, knowing the diagnosis is extremely important because unless you know the diagnosis, you may not be able to offer any research basis genetic uh, or treatment for these children. There are lots of clinical trials which are there out there. So unless you know what is the genetic mutation or abnormality the child is suffering from, you cannot enroll into most of these clinical trials as of now. So this is a very useful uh, graph, which has been from Genetics in Medicine published this year. So what is the impact of next generation sequencing on the uh, outcomes? So as you can see, this red graph, what is going there is the mortality. This is within the sort of 15 to 20 days. There is a steep increase in mortality here. That is because once you know a genetic diagnosis, you are probably withdrawing the care they are dying off. Whereas this is the natural history curve. The green one is the natural history curve. And so most of the lethal disorders, if you get to know confirmatively, you terminate the care, which because it's a futile effort. After that, there is a plateauing of this because these are the conditions where there is a prolonged survival and maybe some improvement with interventions or without interventions. So currently, whatever is can be extrapolated from a few of the studies, this is what is the difference between the if that is the impact of the genetic testing on the NICU care. So probably lots of children here in this group would have been terminated here because of the futile nature of the very expensive and invasive, invasive NICU care. But at the same time, we are also trying to know whether there are treatable disorders where you can change the course of the illness. So we'll come back to this clinical utility again. We'll just go through few case examples which we all can relate to, and then we'll learn few things about this. So neonatal seizures is a very common scenario. So most of the neonatal seizures are acute symptomatic. That is, 
it's a reflection of uh, acute brain injury like hypoglycemia hypoxia electrolyte disturbances infection causing a neonatal seizure so there you do, are not worried about the etiology but when it comes to neonatal epilepsy where the child continues to have refractory seizures at that point we are worried about what is causing all this uh, seizures and whether they can be controlled with a different medication or different types of treatment so that's where we we'll look at few one or two case examples. Day 10 of life, this child first born after three years of married life, second degree consanguinity, 34 weaker, it was a 2.4 kilo child, NICU stay for one day for respiratory distress, no ventilation required, was fine, sent out of ICU. Day 4 started having recurrent brief seizures, no clear focality. And investigations were all normal except for EEG. So blood sugar, hemoglobin, hematocrit, calcium, magnesium, electrolytes, and CSF examination, including lactate, were normal. So I hope this works. OK. Those, these are the type of seizures what the child was having. The clonic jerks and then a spasm. Clonic jerks, then a spasm. So this was the most frequent type of seizure other than just the clonic seizures what the child used to have and they were very frequent seizures. Yeah, so as you can hear that we thought of one of the differential as pyridoxine dependent epilepsy as well and the uh, all the types of medications were tried and this was the type of EEG which was showing high voltage spike wave activity along with attenuation of background very frequent multifocal discharges were there so and there was a burst suppression pattern as well so as we know this is a epileptic encephalopathy so generally most of the epileptic encephalopathies like this would have a poor prognosis so that is what we thought because we are not able to control seizures with uh, your standard medications, MRI, initially faint white matter signal changes in left parietal cortex, but repeat MRI was completely normal. Medications, all the standard medications were used, phenobarbitone, levetiracetam, pyridoxine, phenytoin, topiramate, lorazepam, midazolam drip as well. As you can see, all the standard medications, including biotin was also tried without any response. Biotin test levels were although normal. So then, what are we left with at this point of time? So child continued to have one to do uh, uh, continue to have seizure free period of one to two days, but once again continued to have seizures requiring CPAP and ventilation. So we were stuck at this point of time. Almost we had spent more than 20 days trying to treat this child without success, without able to continuously keep him off ventilator, keep him seizure free. So serum transfer in ISO forms were sent off, paired CSF and serum samples for uh, glucose and uh, glycine were done again, and a whole genome uh, say, uh, NGS was sent off, that's a clinical exam sequencing. And this is what we got the response, that is a pyridoxamine 5 phosphate oxidase deficiency. We, it's a common procedure that we all add after two anti-epileptic medications, we all start off Pyridoxal, uh, py pyridoxine as a standard of care, but pyridoxamine 5 phosphate oxidase deficiency, where pyridoxal 5 phosphate has to be supplemented, which is easily available in the form of tetrafol plus, uh, that can be used. So, what it helped us to recognize, which we earlier thought was not very common, so pyridoxamine 5 phosphate oxidase deficiency can manifest with refractory epilepsy, normal MRI very significantly abnormal EEG. So I think all these things made us uh, a start of pyridoxamine 5-phosphate as, uh, as an additional drug in refractory epilepsy children while we are waiting for the genetic results. So that way it changes your whole management. The most important thing in this sort of situation is the turnaround time of the test. So if the turnaround time of the test is quick, then you actually can make a difference to the critically ill newborn. That makes it very important that uh, you choose a, a test where it can come back quickly. So that is one child. Then another child, term AGA, born by emergency LSCS because of non-progression of labor, 
I had meconium stein liker and uh, um, maternal hypothyroidism was there. By uh, sort of upcars were normal and there are uh, no seizures on day one, day two. By day three started having occasional seizures, no hypoglycemia, MRIs were normal and continued to have multiple seizures per day, failed multiple medications. So once again, we are in a similar situation. We have a normal MRI, abnormal EEG, normal metabolic investigations, normal CSF and refractory epilepsy. So we tried almost uh, six different medications without success. Child continued to have seizures, was encephalopathic, not feeding well and visually impaired. Then we started lacosamide at the around two months of age. And for next one month, there was completely no seizures. So, which actually was a very surprising thing because after all, so many medications, the child continued to have seizures and a small dosage of lacosamide had a seizure control. Then when we uh, were looking at the family history, the father had neonatal seizures and he required medications for almost 20 years with breakthrough seizures in between continued to have but currently is doing very well cognitively is an engineer by profession and this child we sent off the genetics because of the neonatal refractory onset epilepsy kcn q2 heterozygous mutation was noted in the index child and when we tested the fa parents father was carrying the similar kcn2 heterozygous mutation so it is, as we all know, KCNQ2 epileptic encephalopathy is slightly unique. They are a group of uh, disorders wherein they respond to the sodium channel blockers, be it be carbamazepine, be it be phenytoin, be it be lacosamide, they respond very well. So there are case series wherein they have shown combination of any of these medications has given reasonably good seizure control. But until literature from 2015-16, they have, what they have noted is most of them had poor long-term cognitive outcomes. But it may not be necessarily true, especially if it is an autosomal dominant inheritance. If it is sporadic, most of them will have poor cognitive outcome. But here, we already have autosomal dominant inheritance and we know the father carrying the same mutation had a good cognitive outcome. So currently, child is one year, uh, one year old now and she is on levetiracetam and lacosamide well controlled for last nine months and uh, this is a child actually she was in the outpatients today she is walking around at one year recognizing so which is an extremely good outcome normally we don't use uh, the sodium channel blockers in the newborn epileptic encephalopathy but knowing that this kind of mutations you can respond extremely well i think a trial of some of these medications including carbamazepine or lacosamide can be done in the refractory neonatal epilepsy at least as a trial for 15 days or one month and see whether that makes a difference to the seizure so that gives a clue actually to the genotype as well if they respond dramatically to the medication then you are likely looking at kcnq2 related encephalopathy epileptic encephalopathy so this is a uh, elegant article which is about the genetic causes of neonatal epilepsy, how to go about and uh, uh, it's uh, from one of the neonatal seminars. Our own experience uh, from Rainbow, one of our uh, uh, neurology residents uh, has collected the draft of uh, 65 children with neonatal onset epilepsy syndromes, wherein the neuroimaging gave diagnostic information in 20, non-specific information in around 24%. Whereas metabolic investigation gave information in 4.6%. When we did the genetic testing in 23 of these children where we didn't have a diagnosis, we have results of 21 children. We got an answer in 15 of them. 15 of 21, we got a diagnostic answer and we didn't identify any mutation in 6 of them, which will be a very good yield. If you can see this figure, so neuroimaging give diagnostic information in 20%. Tandem mass spectroscopy or the newborn screening gave information in uh, 4%, whereas genetic testing gave information in 22 of 28. This is the latest in uh, figures what we have. The 79% yield was the of the genetic testing. So in the era of, uh, of genetics, 
where you are dealing with refractory neonatal epilepsy syndromes, genetics has probably the highest yield once you rule out the structural pathologies. Summary, in neonatal uh, seizures, there is a role of high quality MRI with ADC and diffusion weighted images. Comprehensive metabolic investigations including your uh, glycine levels, paired glycine levels to be done. And your neonatal epilepsy syndromes without obvious etiology, a targeted gene testing may have a yield of 30 to 50 percent. But if your phenotype is better, your yield of the genetics becomes even better. As the testings are improving in uh, quality, the yield gets better and better. This is about the neonatal epilepsy syndromes. So we'll move on to another case where we learned. Uh, this is an eight-day-old baby, 3.2 kilo, delivered uh, by a Gravida 2 Para 1 uh, mother. Uh, on uh, at, uh, So that's the time of delivery. On day five of life, baby was found to be unresponsive at home, restated for cardiac arrest, did a CPR and intubated in the uh, referral hospital, found to have severe metabolic acidosis, hypotension, stabilized with inotropes, Seizures on day two after the cardiac arrest required two anti-epileptics. The child was encephalopathic without any body movements or spontaneous respiratory efforts. So there was no, it's a non-consanguineous marriage. Interestingly, in 2016, they had their first baby boy who died on day 21 of life, who had a sudden death while they were in Rajasthan in mother's uh, parents' house. So the parents, when they had, they could find similarity in both the deaths both the events. So they were very clear that there is something going on, they need investigation. So the child was essentially brain dead by that time. So uh, they, they told the doctor in that referral hospital, we want further investigation, you know, shift to a place where all the investigations can be done. So the child, uh, so this is a, a sudden unexpected neonatal death. There are lots of etiologies, sepsis, meningitis, these things are unlikely because the two children are affected with almost similar cardiac structural rhythm abnormalities, respiratory, metabolic, and neurological and neuromuscular etiologies can cause sudden unexpected neonatal deaths. So here there are no clues. So lots of investigations were done, including all the sepsis screen, calcium, magnesium, blood gas, newborn screening, neuroimaging showed evidence of diffuse hypoxia, which was secondary to the cardiac arrest. So there was no diagnostic information on the neuroimaging. Now conduction testing, at that point, there was no response we could get. And uh, so what we did was we performed both muscle, skin and nerve biopsy as well. Did eye examination, no clues there. And uh, we, all the metabolic investigations were normal. So these were the blood gases showing severe metabolic acidosis during the post restation. So there were no clues on the liver functions and all the other testings, no evidence of infection. Chest x-ray was normal. All the blood lactate was slightly high. Ammonia, CPKs were normal. CSF analysis was normal as well. And EEG showed diffuse cerebral dysfunction. And now conduction, as I said, was not showing any excitable nerves. The, uh, muzzle and nerve biopsy which came back two months later were normal. So what are the further plans and possibilities? If it was a live interactive session, we could have had a, a excellent discussion on the what are the possibilities you people would be thinking and what you would do. So this is what we had done. So a exome sequencing was sent and a gene called AK, AKAP9 gene, which is autosomal dominant or sporadic inheritance, which causes long Q2 syndrome type 11, was noted. So because of this, the children had sudden cardiac deaths because of the long Q2 syndrome. They can be very severe, very early onset. So normally you find this kind of thing in a sudden syncopes when people have while they are exercising and other things, you suspect long QT syndrome when syncopes in unusual positions like while sleeping, having a, a hypotensive episode, you think of long QT syndrome. But this gene is known to be associated with autosomal dominant long QT syndrome. So this child had QTC interval of 507 milliseconds, which is way above the cutoff. So here, the parents were very clear and I think the parental awareness and linking both the deaths 
to a similar kind of event and asking for investigations irrespective of they knew that the child was brain dead but they pursued that they wanted to get a answer to the cause of death i think that gave us an answer and here the once again the next generation sequencing helped us to nail the diagnosis so the advantage of it is next pregnancy obviously you are going to do amniocentesis or you can also offer a pre implantation genetic diagnosis because already mother has had two pregnancies so it makes life so much clear for the family to plan next pregnancy and you as a clinician has learned so much from this one family so i think uh, that's where the ngs comes into role in the nicu so just as a off bit so there are a lot of advances in treatment in sma as we know news in arsan there it was in news in india because the company has offered uh, treatment for uh, around 25 to 30 infants the selection process was being going on but i think it has made people to pool the data on sma which is definitely a good process we do not know what is going to happen and gene replacement therapy is other thing which will co- it costs around 14 crores at this point of time which is obviously unaffordable for any one of us but in india if you go on uh, uh, one of the websites i found all these things so there is a spin raza which is at 80 lakhs per unit which is the actual cost but there are people who are advertising at 37000 and somebody even at 563 rupees per pack <laughs> so this is openly blatantly on the websites so we will have to be very careful uh, with the, all this uh, things in india okay so we'll coming back to the uh, cases uh, this is a term first born child by, born by cesarean section indication was non progress of labor 3 kg uh, child cried immediately mild tachypnea was there reduced after 1 hour and uh, later on was noted to have breathing difficulty and uh, cpap was tried in view of uh, carbon dioxide build up and the carbon dioxide build up was to the extent of 110 mm of mercury which is extremely high and conventional ventilation with minimal pressure you are able to blow off the uh, carbon dioxide which means that there was a ventilatory failure baby was very active on ventilation normal cranial nerves good anti gravity movements normal deep tendon reflexes good muscle bulk no contractures and as i already said you used to build up uh, carbon dioxide on reducing the ventilation interestingly the maximal respiratory rate throughout the course of his stay was 20 mi- per minute and it is extremely low for a newborn term newborn so your comfortable breathing will be around 40 as you all know or 30 to 40 but this never went to beyond 20 per minute which tells us something about something in the drive central respiratory drive is a problem because most of the children newborn babies or adults anybody with the respiratory problem start breathing fast especially with that kind of co2 you try to wash it out you start breathing faster and faster but here that never happened yes. which is a biggest handle for a clinician on the bedside i had had a normal chest x ray uh, so we it, as a standard we did the cpk to look at the muscle disease repetitive nerve stimulation now conduction testing all of them were normal mri brain was normal normal lactate normal ammonia and tandem spectroscopy i examination echocardiogram everything was normal so at this point what is the test we are going to go through we can have a question session can we come out of the this one presentation can anybody answer this what is the next course you are going to do what is the diagnosis we are thinking of i am not able to see actually okay so anybody can uh, send a question uh, or answer sorry okay so then here at this point we thought yes we are looking at a genetic disease very likely which is causing a low drive and uh, 
we sent a specific genetic testing for a change that was not uh, next generation sequencing. This was way back uh, before the NGS was available in India. And uh, we asked for the FOX2B gene mutation, which codes for central congenital hypoventilation syndrome, which is secondary to expanded alleles containing tel polynomial repeats producing the genotype of 20 by 30 in the index child. Normally, the uh, uh, genotype is 20 by 30, normally. So in this child, there was a expansion by around 10 polyalanine repeats. So this is one of the first report of neonate from India with genetically confirmed CCHS, which we published in 2012. So this drives another point, this case, that all conditions cannot be picked up by just uh, your clinical exome or whole exome sequencing. This is a test you have to specifically think of your genetic diagnosis because none of your investigation is going to give a clue. As you saw, none of this investigation. So just that the child does not breathe with a normal brain scan normal as ancillary investigations and your rates of breathing especially during the sleep are extremely low and you might have association of uh, neuroblastoma and other kind of tumors you can have Hirschsprung disease so if you have those kind of association you know this is a part of neurochristopathies so then you are more or less clear that you are dealing with a central congenital hypoventilation syndrome it's reasonably common in the western population there are children who actually go to uh, colleges uh, with their uh, ventilation on the tracheostomy on a wheelchair and uh, so they are reasonably uh, socially active because their lifespan can be maintained for a long period there are various uh, protocols and statements to how to manage and monitor these children on the longer term but in India unfortunately we don't have that kind of support system once we gave this diagnosis to the family uh, the family uh, wanted to discontinue and the child uh, didn't survive. So at least whatever the decision was made easier for the family and now uh, the testing actually can be accessed from Bristol, uh, Bristol uh, in UK uh, wherein they have two types of testing. One is expedited TAT of around 72 hours and the other one is between 7 to 10 days which is a very quick TAT for this kind of testing. Although it's expensive, it's really worth the money if you are strongly suspecting a central congenital hypoventilation syndrome. Okay. So carefully look at the clinical picture. So this is a newborn was antenatally detected to have significant redu reduction in the body movements. So requiring a CPAP ventilation from the point the child was born. And you can see there is absolutely no movements of any parts of the body. This is all the child was just lying in this position. Bilateral hip dislocation, knee dislocation, abnormal position of the foot, and uh, there was a respiratory embarrassment as well. As you can see, the child was requiring CPAP ventilation. So, and there was on palpation of the muscles, very poor muscle bulk was seen and muscle fibrosis on the muscle ultrasound was seen. This, uh, so, this was a antenatally uh, detected reduced fetal movements with arthrogryposis, respiratory failure at birth, had a right femoral fracture as well and uh, fixed joints all because there are no movements in tri -train. and fibrosed muscles there are no tongue fasciculations so it's a intra onset of a pathological process that is very clear cpk at birth was 550 which is not very high for a newborn so based on this we thought of a clinical diagnosis of possible congenital myopathy or any other forms of congenital neuromuscular disorders Congenital muscular dystrophies usually will have slightly higher CPKs, although the muscles were so wasted, possible that that is also there, CMD. So these are the two common, uh, this one. But uh, I think the uh, this one, uh, what we found on, so the parents were very clear, if we can't do uh, anything for the child, we don't want to continue. So what we did was the newborn sequence, the uh, NGS, uh, which was done, and that showed a nebulin gene compound heterozygous mutation in the family. I think it's moving on its own. Uh, 
compound heterozygous mutation, uh, which we could uh, uh, see there as a one each heterozygous mutation was there in the uh, both the mother and father, confirming the diagnosis of a Nemelin rod myopathy. So, Nemelin rod myopathy is one of the commonest uh, congenital myopathies who present in the newborn period with a very severe onset disease. So, this is uh, one way where you can say, okay, this is a condition wherein you cannot treat it, but at least next pregnancy will be able to help you. Okay. Yes. I think we'll just try to take few questions in between. There are a lot of cases we discussed. Okay. So I think a lot of people uh, answered that. So uh, so Babu Madhkar, Madhkar has asked KCN Q2 seizure does not respond to phenytoin administration. Uh, there are reported literature wherein uh, clear uh, response to sodium uh, channel blockers including phenytoin has been shown and even the encephalopathy might improve with both carbamazepine, phenytoin and possibly topiramate as well. So that is what the uh, this one. Uh, so it's a sodium channel blockade uh, is uh, what is uh, uh, going to be helpful to reduce the encephalopathy. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Srikant, ECG for PR interval. Uh, yeah, so th that was uh, done and uh, the QT interval, we had not looked into. I don't have the information on the PR interval at that time. So only the QTC, what was calculated was prolonged. Yeah, so on dyne scar, central congenital hypoventilation. I think most of you have got the answers were all the initiated ones. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think keep posting questions in between. We'll break and answer the questions. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, all these patients require a detailed neurological exam and try to find very clinical, uh, specific clinical clues to a specific diagnosis. And uh, you need to explain the family as to why we are doing what investigations, what is the utility of these investigations, and always try and look for treatable conditions and uh, uh, give a good supportive treatment throughout. So this is another child uh, with respiratory failure. I think these are the two common themes actually, what you find in newborn unit, which will make us do a, uh, a genetic testing in the newborn unit. So two weeks of life, this child had recurrent apneas. He was a IUGR child uh, born after IVF. Uh, the, both the sperm and bone donor were both the parents only. And then uh, uh, had a, a birth weight of around 1.8 kilos at 36 weeks. And by two weeks of life, recurrent apneas were noted. There was a hernia operation which was done for this child and the post operatively started having uh, apneas again then uh, because of the recurrent apneas uh, required invasive ventilation then the neurology consult was requested because of recurrent apneas on examination there was a distal atherogryposis there were contractures at the uh, angle some distal muscle wasting was noted no uh, skin abnormalities and the respiratory muscle weakness was also noted Predominantly, the, only the intercostal muscle movement were seen. So, so we knew that there was some neuromuscular weakness which was going on in this child. On X-ray, as you can see here, there is a diaphragmatic eventration, and uh, which is indicating there is a weakness, early weakness of diaphragm. So the now conduction, what we did apart from other investigations showed there is a sensory motor axonal polyneuropathy. So this was in almost 19, uh, sorry, 2011. So we are stuck with this child without a diagnosis. And uh, normally SMA causes only motor axonal neuropathy or neuronopathy. But here clearly sensory was also involved. So either you are looking at a autosomal recessive axonal polyneuropathy early onset, which could be possible. 
or some other diagnosis. The yield rate of getting a genetic answer for a axonal motor sensory HMSN kind of HMSN group of disorders is low. So we were stuck with this uh, child and uh, luckily I had a conference in uh, uh, sort of uh, Cairo uh, with uh, uh, the International Child Neurology Meeting and had an opportunity to discuss with one of the neuromuscular specialists there. When I discussed, he said, why don't you test for this? This is one of the common thing we see with this phenotype. If you don't get that answer, then we'll look at other diagnosis. So then we send the sample to uh, uh, UK at that time in London. So they tested and got an answer. So do we know what this can be? So a child, recurrent apneas, IUGR, and then failure to thrive, ventilatory uh, difficulties, and diaphragm more than intercostal weakness. Spinal muscular atrophy as intercostal muscle weakness more than diaphragm. So diaphragmatic breathing will be more. Whereas here, the more of the weakness was of intercostal uh, diaphragmatic, early diaphragmatic weakness, early respiratory failure. So that was the handle. So you can send your answers. Meanwhile, we'll carry on. So this was spinal muscular atrophy with a respiratory distress type 1, which is secondary to immunoglobin mu binding protein defect. It is not the SMN related. It's a completely different gene. And uh, we published this in Indian Annals of Indian Academy of Neurology. Uh, so what it tells is, even though it was in the pre-NGS era, the phenotyping, getting the information in you know, narrowed down, narrowed down, getting your handles correct. And when you are stuck, there are always people around the world who are more experienced than you, more knowledgeable than you in a given area of expertise. Take always their help. I think just a five minute discussion helped us to narrow down the diagnosis, get this answer because parents were very hopeful. It was of IVF pregnancy. They wanted to do everything. So once we gave a diagnosis, then they said, yes, we know the, this nothing can be done. They withdrew the care. So until that point, we just continued the ventilation. Six weeks is another one month of uh, time to get the reports from London. So almost two and a half months we had ventilated this child. So that is how your genetic testing along with your clinical skills makes things better for the families. Okay, so this is another themed respiratory, but slightly different etiology. Uh, uh, baby uh, of ER, three day old term baby, 3.2 kilos. On day three of life, baby had excessive cry, poor feeding and admitted to hospital. Seizures loaded with injection phenobarbitone, thrice and levy pill. Then later on had to, noted to have respiratory difficulties with apnea requiring ventilatory support. So initially it's usually attributed to either repeated dosage of phenobarbitone and a transient, this one. On examination, head circumference was at the third centile as compared to weight, which was normal. So there is something going on intracranially even before birth, which is what is the clue there. No dysmorphism or organomegaly, no contractures, wasting, no fasciculations. Head lag was there and child was dull looking. Extraocular movements were full with truncal hypotonia. Deep tendon reflexes at knee were brisk. So the child had central hypotonia, respiratory failure with seizures with a uh, microcephaly, relative microcephaly as compared to the body weight. So this was the clinical clues we had. We know it is coming from central rather than a peripheral cause of respiratory failure. And it is also involving the encephalon. It's a more diffuse disease as compared to earlier pathologies what we had seen. So the MRI gave us a clue here. You can see the splenium is relatively well preserved, but the body is thinned out. The genu is almost disappeared. So it's an introitrine onset of a disease, which has caused significant thinning out of the body of corpus callosum and almost the genu has disappeared. Same this one, you can see. Apart from that, you can see cystic lesions in the basal ganglia area here. So these two areas are cystic changes. This is one cyst, this is one cyst. So in the basal ganglia area, cystic changes are there. So you have white matter loss causing thinning of corpus callosum, 
you have cystic changes in the basal ganglia complex and the surrounding white matter. So you can see it here just around the margins of lentiform nucleus and the ventriculomegaly which is seen. So in view of clinical findings, uh, blood lactate was uh, done which was elevated and CSF lactate was also significantly elevated. MRI brain feature suggestive of uh, uh, mitochondrial disorder, muscle biopsy was done for respiratory enzyme, complex one deficiency was noted. So if you are doing muscle biopsy in this situation, no point doing it, just a respiratory muscle biopsy without respiratory enzyme analysis. So when you do muscle biopsy, you need to flash freeze it at minus 70 degrees in liquid nitrogen and only Nimans does the respiratory enzyme analysis and uh, they test from uh, complex one to complex four. In our uh, series of uh, more than 35 children, complex one and four deficiency were the most frequent respiratory enzyme deficiencies what we found in our cohort. So here it was complex one deficiency. As you can see, this is how the report will be. So usual causes would be pyruvate dehydrogenase versus pyruvate carboxylase deficiency will have this kind of uh, presentation in the newborn period. So we have gone through various types of vitamin responsive disorders, types of genetic mutations which cause different cause of seizures where a different type of anti-epileptic medication will help to treat the neonatal seizures. We have gone through neuromuscular respiratory failure secondary to your primary with non-structural CNS conditions like CCHS neuromuscular failure secondary to a muscle disease, secondary to a nerve disease and then we have looked at respiratory failure secondary to mitochondrial disorders. So in all of these conditions, the answer is usually in the genetics and it helps to give the family an answer to the problem and solution as a part of treatment in some of them as we had in pyridoxine dependent epilepsy and also in the KCNQ2 encephalopathy. Uh, so all these things, uh, sorry, pyridoxal 5-phosphate deficiency. So similarly, we have had one child who was actually three, uh, two year old who presented with intermittent seizures. He was on uh, two medications, failed and then he uh, was on pheno, uh, sorry, pyridoxal phosphate. Uh, uh, sorry, pyridoxine uh, uh, 100 milligram, it was well controlled. Then suddenly the family came in with uh, multiple seizures, gradually increased and went into super refractory status. So what they didn't disclose at that point is the seizures were well controlled on the pyridoxine and they had stopped pyridoxine few days back. So that information was missed for initial two days child had refractory status and required five, six anti-epileptics, midazolam, drip and uh, ketamine, didn't get controlled. Then the moment we gave pyridoxine, the EEG became completely normal. Then retrospectively, we confirmed genetically that this child has pyridoxine dependent epilepsy. So if uh, this kind of refractory epilepsy, if you have an upfront Yes, this child has pyridoxine dependent epilepsy. You will tell them 100% you are no way going to stop this child, uh, the pyridoxine. He has to continue it for life. And all that they require is not even any anti-epileptic, just the pyridoxine. That's all they require. So that's how it can make a difference to your long-term management of these children. <clears throat> So I think we'll just refresh again when to suspect a genetic disorder in neonatal situation, life threatening critical conditions like cardiopulmonary failure, multi organ failure, lacking a easy medical explanation, severe organ disease of unknown pathogenesis, especially in case of poor responsiveness to standard treatment, severe congenital malformations that are not consistent with any known syndrome, severe unexplained neurological signs, metabolic failure of unknown origin severe non-specific and undifferentiated conditions at birth and other unexplained acute conditions. So if you have any of these things you tick and then you would probably have to consider doing a uh, appropriate testing according to the clinical handles and what are the syndromic diagnosis you are getting to. So this is another flow chart which was published in 2017 as a multi speciality consensus uh, uh, presentation. So same thing, uh, newborn infant in NICU, 
with the following conditions life threatening critical conditions lacking medical explanation severe organ disease of unknown pathogenesis congenital malformation same uh, indication so you do a genetic counseling non genetic counsel uh, etiologies to be excluded so what are your clinical signs lab investigations and what is the uh, thing you are looking at in the genetic condition so based on pre and perinatal history a non genetic etiology can explain the disease then you don't have to do any genetic testing the phenotypic presentation of disease is highly consistent with the non genetic condition it's genetically homogeneous something like spinal muscular atrophy pompous disease you just do the single gene testing genetically heterogeneous you are not very sure what you are looking at rapid look at the rapid specific test available so if it is available do the rapid specific test if it is not available you have to do a uh, depending on what you are looking at whole exome sequencing or a chromosomal microarray or if the phenotypic presentation is not consistent with any known genetic condition any possible known non genetic condition consistent with the phenotype has been excluded then once again you have to look at the similar uh, uh, uh either do a whole exome sequencing followed by array so this flow chart i think more or less we had discussed at the beginning so you have to systematically make sure that you have ruled out a acquired condition you have uh, made sure there is a very narrowed down syndromic diagnosis with very good handles then you send so if you send off a genetic testing without a good clinical phenotyping the chance of we getting a diagnosis is going to be very thin so as a clinician our prerogative is to make sure you give as much clinical information as possible with the syndromic diagnosis to the genetic lab if we don't do that you will have a extremely uh, low return of the genetic diagnosis because the clear, the geneticist or the bioinformatics person is sitting there trying to analyze the data with your clinical information in perspective so if you give very little clinical information you will get very little back so if you give more and more you go back to them they send a genetic testing result if it is matching very well fine if it is not matching you go back to the genetic person say this is not matching this phenotype is different we do it almost weekly basis with the genetic labs at Uh, there are a lot of cases where we could solve going to and fro to and fro over a period of sometimes it might take one month sometimes six months but we make them yes this is not at all in fact we had a family of two girls affected with uh, hypomyelination so we were given one genetic uh, mutation which was uh, uh, causing intellectual disability we said this is clearly not a thing then they tested other child other sib is not matching with that phenotype genotype so we said anyway the mri is not consistent with the uh, genetic mutation what you have given then they looked back again and they gave a gjc2 phenotype gjc2 is a hypomyelinating disorder which is autosomal recessive in nature as compared to more common hypomyelinating disorder which is seen usually in boys which is x linked so that's how you could Uh, your mri was very clearly uh, shouting at you saying that it is not a intellectual disability syndrome it is a hypomyelinating disorder that was your biggest handle in this family and when we persisted with that the geneticist went back and picked it up so those things can happen that's why it has to be extremely careful okay uh, and it's always any investigations it has to be a two way process to close the loop summary uh, targeted testing according to phenotype is ideal clinotype clinical exome or whole exome will not give answers in all situations in newborn neuromuscular or respiratory failures you need to look specifically something conditions like cchs or congenital myotonic dystrophy you have to ask specifically for those things you are looking at triple repeat expansions in myotonic dystrophies and fox to be expansion in cchs so unless you ask for that this your ngsv is not going to give an answer okay at the end of the day it's a team work family and the child at the center neonatologist or the pediatrician looking after the family and the child neurologist genetic counselor and the geneticist make a part of this team thank you any questions we'll take okay 
so uh, yeah that was smart one that is the right answer uh, resource con uh, resource the ivadinam yeah in resource content setting how do we diagnose such cases so i think sir it is a very important question uh, because the resource uh, today uh, we have the cheapest exome sequencing in whole of the world nowhere in the world you can get a exome sequencing whole exome sequencing for 20 25000 believe me it is 10 times more expensive in uk 15 times more expensive in us so you have the cheapest test available in whole of the world and if you know the diagnosis if because you are narrowing it down your diagnosis if you can tell the family the diagnosis in 10 15 days and withdraw the care which is not necessary or give appropriate treatment which is necessary you will make a huge difference even in the resource constraint setting it's all in the mindset we feel that okay we they cannot afford we because unless we believe it can make a difference we will not offer and discuss the such expensive test to the parents we have done more than sort of 500 600 tests so far so it is never that the finance is not the only constraint it is our belief that how we can communicate across to the families that yes this is going to answer my problem this is going to give a answer to the question so i think that is most important here muscle biopsy respiratory analysis turn around time is long so it is usually around uh, sort of 6 uh, weeks and expense is around uh, the nimans charges i think it was around 8000 earlier probably now around 12000 but to send the liquid nitrogen box uh, is uh, sort of uh, around 6000 extra and muscle biopsy charges extra sensitivity is pretty good in our own series we had a sensitivity of around 85% so that's a pretty good sensitivity uh, that is question by shrikant uh, okay margin agent bankers uh, okay anything else question sir Hmm? Or not two questions are there? No, sir. Fine, we'll close it. I hope that was useful. Uh, uh, we are running late, uh, so probably another one minute, and then we can uh, uh, close the session. Okay, so. uh as all of you clinicians uh, as you keep we are all uh, many of uh, most of you have been interacting and i don't know how uh, many have been online uh are all quite young so the technology is going to keep improving you are going to keep having more and more uh, testing at uh, your uh, service but as a clinician you make the decision as to what is the most important uh, testing uh, uh, what is the most important test for the given child i always tell my train is there is no routine test the test is always specific to what the child requires okay so be it be a cbp or be it be a genome sequencing or a microarray only if the clinical condition requires you test it otherwise there is no word of routine blood test okay or any of the routine test so you need to tailor your testings according to the requirement for the child's condition thank you